Okay, Joe, the album is called X. We're talking Roman numerals here. We're talking album number 10. Where's Def Leppard in this millennium compared to where they used to be? Well, trying to move on, I suppose, trying to do something that's um, not straight out the back catalogue. You know, we, we've um, we spent a lot of time talking about this record before we recorded it as to what kind of record we wanted to make. Um, the last album, um, Euphoria, was kind of like the blueprint for it was let's try and write an album that's as varied as the Greatest Hits album would be, which is a collection of songs over a 15 year period, where you can see the growth, but you can also see the variety. Um, <clears throat> that's what we did on the last record, and we were, we were reasonably happy with it, but um, with this one, we just wanted to push it a bit further and, and like not be worrying about any direction. And if a song came up that was not typical of what we'd do, uh, we weren't gonna rule it out just because of that. And uh, we also decided to mix it up a bit sonically by using three different producers. So um, we basically set about to make a pop record that was guitar based. Like all the best records that we grew up listening to. You know, I mean, we, you know, you know, we've known each other a long time. We grew up listening to Radio One, which was the only thing that we had in England at the time. And luckily, between 71 and 75, a lot of pop music was very guitar based. Slade, even Susie Quattro, you know, was screaming away to number one with Devil Gate Drive, which would today be probably called heavy metal, you know. So we grew up on a lot of pop stuff, and we just used that as a background for what we were going to do is keep it simple, keep it um, the way that Ray Davies used to write songs, or, you know, we, 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 we did use a, you know, a few new tricks, you know, the Pro Tools and the samples and stuff like that. But from a songwriting point of view, we just wanted to make it very melodic and very commercial. But don't you find that a lot of pop music even these days is very guitar based compared to the 90s, say? Oh yeah, it is. The, um, in the 90s, to me, a pop song with guitars in it was just a grunge song that got through the net yeah. in Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, etc. Um, now you've got Nickelback, who people are regarding as a, as a pop band. Yeah, that's the point. You All know. this new metal stuff is the new pop stuff yeah. or whatever. And, and, and it's even like with bands like System of a Down, there's actually melody, um, albeit, you know, sung in a lot more kind of tough way. But there's melody there. It's not just noise for noise sake, which seems to be the big thing in the 90s. So if this album X is to appeal to right across the board, as previous Def Leppard albums were as well, if a guy is wearing a corn t-shirt, if a guy is wearing a Metallica t-shirt, that's like a bonus to you, but you're not necessarily trying to hit those guys. No, we're not. We're, um, we're, we're like most bands, we've got the arrogance of hoping that the hardcore audience will come with us wherever we go. Yeah. Um, what you obviously try and do after that is the same kind of things that like um, Carlos Santana did with, with Super, Supernatural. And, and the guy comes, goes from 30 years of like not selling records to selling 10 million records in, in, in nine months, you know. Um, and he's obviously pulling in a lot of people that had never even heard of, of Santana. Of course. Um, and that's what we did with Hysteria. We, people bought that record that had, would never again buy a Def Leppard record, but they just happened to like that album. Okay, but what about the approach to recording of the X album? I mean, uh, do you like writing the songs? Do you like getting the songs together? Do you like putting them out on stage? Do you like the audience reaction? And do you hate the bit in the middle? In other words, recording. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of recording. Um, it's, it's a means to an end for me. Um, the actual writing process is fun because you're actually there at the development of it. Um, then when you actually have to come to build the thing, that's what it's, it's literally is, bricks and mortar, and it's, it's, it becomes labor. Mm. And it's, it's just like a sonic building site. And it's, it's hard sometimes because you hear it in your head and you don't always get it down onto tape or onto disc as it is now, the way that you hear it. And sometimes it takes a long time to actually, you just have to keep going at it, trying it different ways before it actually starts sounding the way it should. When you're not on stage, what's the adrenaline rush? Is it going to bed at night having this song and saying, no, that chord didn't work? Something that keeps you awake about the creative process is the one that you say, this is actually what gives me the pumping feeling. Yeah, there's more sleepless nights than, than not because you, notoriously, one song, I, I always find that there's one song on every album that you write in three minutes and the other nine are just like massive, te it's just a teeth pulling process, you know. And you, you very rarely go to bed having finished the song. You think you finished it, you nearly finished it and you lay there looking at the ceiling thinking, Oh God, please, just what's the missing link here? Because you don't necessarily know what it is. Sometimes you know that you haven't got a chorus. Sometimes you've got the chorus, you don't know how to get to it. 
Um, and eventually, when you do get there, you get your, you get your one night sleep, which might be about one, <laughs> one every t once every ten days. Um, but that is an adrenaline rush in itself. Is is when you actually get through to it, and you, you all look at each other and go, "Yep, I think this works." And it's like, "Wow, that was so cool." You know, but do you have to sometimes? Do you think live with a song so much that you actually hate it, and you have to le leave it go for a week? Yeah, we've done that. We've 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 got songs finished that we know they're actually done. I can't talk about it right now because we've been we've been coming back to this one for four months. We've believed in the song that much that we would keep coming. We would work on it for four months. You'd work on it for a while and then you'd leave it and you'd okay, go away. I'm not going to make any excuses here. I want to interrupt you specifically here to say this. The Beatles went into a thing and did their first album, which is a great album, in about one day. Yeah, and recorded yeah. the whole thing and wrote the whole thing there in one day. Do you ever long for those days, Joe? I do, yeah, but I don't believe the Beatles wrote that album in one day. Oh, I, think, say that. I think the Beatles <laughs> would have written that album over a period of about a year and gone into recording one oh, day. Right. If we'd have spent a year in a rehearsal room writing the songs and just playing them through, we could have gone into a studio and recorded this album in probably two or three months. But to an extent, having your own studios, that's really what you do do. Exactly. So the actual, it, what it is, it's not that we were in the studio. We were in the, we started this album, the concept of this album started on the 7th of July last year. So we're actually in under a year. And that wasn't all recording. You know, the actual recording of this album probably took seven months, which is for us probably the third fastest album we've done and the fastest since High and Dry in 1981. So this was quicker than Pyromania. Debut album, albums. folks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, you know, we, because I live here and the other three guys live in California, Sav was here, he's moved back to Sheffield, we'd come in and do six weeks at a time. It's like an oil rig. You know, you come in and do your shift and then you go home. We do six weeks and then everybody go home for a couple of weeks. You get to live with what you've worked with. We get back together again and somebody would notoriously go, you know, song four, whatever, it's not right. It's in the wrong key or it's too slow or the chorus isn't strong enough. You get to live with it rather than if you just record all the songs at once, you're just banging through them so much, you don't get the time to wonder if you've actually done the right thing, which is what we do. And there's too much pressure on us to uh, m mess up. We can't, we aren't, we're at that point of our career where we can't mess, we can't afford to mess up. Yeah. One bad record and whoosh, it's gone, you know. When you're 42 and not 28, it's harder to, to, to do it. All of a sudden, you go through a period where you're so uncool because of your age, and then all of a sudden, you can be 10 years older than the uncool period, and you're cool again. I.e., Tony Bennett a few years ago. Yeah, it's weird Neil Young a few years ago, yeah. who was so much cooler at the age of 53 or whatever than he was at the age of 43. Yeah. So you have to just bide your time, and we weren't prepared to just go sit on a beach in the Bahamas with a, a daiquiri just waiting for the moment. We had ideas and we were prepared to give it a shot. And if it didn't work, it didn't work, you know. I mean, there's no shame in losing as long as you actually perform and, and go There's no there sense where Def Leppard then are seen at the moment as being the daddy of a lot of this pop or new metal, as you call it, from Sum 41 to Blink-182 to Linkin Park to all of these bands. Are you seen as a bit of a kind of a, like, do any of those bands cite you? I mean, in terms of like Train Recent or Creed or... Yeah, recently it's actually started happening. There was a time where... The, the grunge thing, we were the most hated band on the planet. There's absolutely no doubt about it. People like Soundgarden and, and, and well, not so much Pearl Jam, but... So you're talking 92, 93? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were actually cited as the enemy. We were the Antichrist. And I found that a little unfair because I saw what they were trying to say, but I think they were actually aiming the, the darts at the wrong dartboard. Def Leppard did what we did. We created a, a, a sound that was ours, was copied by another 150 bands. And I think it was the other 150 bands that they should have been throwing the darts at. It was your wingers and your warrants and your poisons and, 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 what, and Cinderella's who were just copying everything that we did, the, the, the big harmonies, the big guitars. Um, but we got lumped in with it, whereas in actual fact, we weren't anything to do with that. You've just mentioned <laughs> some bands there like Cinderella, Darken and Poison and that. Are you ever aware of, I don't want to end up like those guys, which could have happened? Oh, I could have done had we not had just that ingredient that you can't buy. There's a chemistry within this band and there's a dignity within this band that we, we were on our last tour. I mean, and I really hate saying this because you know, you are what you are and you do what you do. But we were touring on our last album and we were seeing adverts in, lo in towns where there was a, a four band back to the eighties tour. <laughs> Doc and Cinderella, Poison and, and Rat. Yeah, the chicken and they in were, the bag circus. They were playing a bowling alley. Yeah. And I was thinking, one of these poor saps is actually going on first to play 20 minutes in a bowling alley where there's probably 40 people watching. And, and like, I never once thought to myself that could have been me.
Our program will return in a moment. On Ovation, the Arts Network. How do you state the game? Is it a vitality? Is it a chemistry? Is it a, is it a bit of luck involved? Yeah, it's, you know what, you just, you, I can't even answer it. You just answered it yourself. That's exactly what it is. Chemistry you can't buy, it just works. That's why you could take one band member out of a lineup and it just isn't the same. And then that guy can join, rejoin five years later and it's back. It's, it's, you know, and if you're lucky enough, like you two, to have maintained the same chemistry, what makes them work is the things that probably annoy them the most about each other. Mm. The fact that, I don't know how it works within you two, but I'm sure that the edge ruffles Bono's feathers and vice versa to get the best out of them. They don't have, whereas I, I, I get the impression with someone like McCartney, there is nobody saying, Paul, that's awful, stop it. And the last time that happened was Lennon, and maybe for the one album he did with Elvis Costello. Otherwise, it's like, how do you tell God Almighty that he's, uh, yeah. he's just written an awful song? Because yeah. he'll just fire you off the album whether you be the bass player, the drummer, or the producer. Because I don't think certain people listen. When you're in a band, you've got no option but to listen because it's a democracy. So, you know, the, the, there's always good luck. And the good luck is just the alignment of whatever stars you want to involve. Like I mentioned earlier about the record companies. Sometimes your record company is full of great staff. And three years later, you put another album out. They've all left to go and join another one. New people have come in. They don't know what they're doing. They're in the same desk, they just haven't got the same brain. They don't understand you, they've got no history with you. Yeah. And they start making decisions on your behalf that are so wrong. Because, and then you have to nail them and say, why didn't you ring us and talk to us first? Yeah, exactly. So we, you have to know, that's the knowledge thing then. You make sure that you get onto all these people and say, look, before any decisions get made, you talk to us to make sure that that's the direction that we want to go in. Because this is our art, you're just marketing it for us. I've always been a music fan rather than one of these arty types that's like, I'm destined for success. Yeah. I just wanted it. You know, I was a I was a gobshite kid. You know, I was a fan. I had every record from Cat Stevens to Emerson Lake and Palmer. And, and you still have between. all the programs from all the gigs you yes. went to in Sheffield in pristine condition. I'm what a ticket. sad man. I am. And the tickets. Okay. But fine. the thing is, the, the music you mentioned earlier on in terms of great um, guitar pop and all that in the early 70s, if I say 75, you kind of started. And like, I think you were very quickly playing by Hammersmith Orion. And Rick was only 16 at the time and all this sort of thing. Like, there had been T Rex on top of the pops. There had been Martha Hooper, which is still your favourite and all the rest, and all the young dudes, etc. So there was great pop music. You came into a band. It still happened overnight. I don't care what you say. It was pretty. Def Leppard was overnight more than virtually any band I know. <laughs> ah, no, 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 no. No. Westlife's overnight. <laughs> First single, number one. Next 10 million yeah. singles, number one. We actually formed in 77. We made our first recording in 78. Our first album came out in 1980. We did our first tour of, um, of England with ACDC when Rick was 16 in 79. We had our first hit in, the, in Europe in 1987. Literally 10 months, yeah. 10 years and two months since we first did a gig. Yeah. And we had our first American hit seven years after we formed. It, you know, that's overnight success. Fine, I'll take it, you know. The, but we put all the work in, you know. And we come from an era where you're actually, you're, you actually can at least be given the opportunity to do that. We were signed to a five album deal. We could put out an album and it'd be like, all right, well, better look next time, boys. It's your first record, don't worry about it. We built and built and built, and we broke, in America at least, in Canada, on our third album, which was the way that it was always before us. But slightly after that, that whole thing went away. And now, if your first album doesn't shift units, the MD, who used to be probably a, a, an ex-musician, but is now, in this day and age, an accountant, if he sees that you're in the lost profit, the, pro, you know, the, 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 the negative column of the profit and loss columns, mm. you're dropped. Mm. You don't even get to make a second record. You know, so we, we, were, we were lucky. It is, it's very scary. I feel, a, I feel bad for, I, I think of all the, the bands that I know who didn't happen until their fourth album. Or the, you know, like U2, for example, globally didn't really break big until The Unforgettable Fire. If they were signed now, they would never get to make that album. Yeah. You know. That is pretty scary, isn't it? It's I mean, it really is. And it's sad. Yeah. It's really sad. It's That's why I, 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 even though I was only 10 and I didn't know anything about it, I still hark back to how wonderful it must have been.
to be signed to Island Records, yeah. 69 to 72, when they had everything from Jimmy Cliff to Fotheringa, you name it. Because you know Chris Blackwell was cool. Absolutely. From traffic to John and Beverly Martin. He's, to Cat Stevens he, was what, that, yeah. what, what, he was what Richard Branson tried to yeah. do. He would sign the acts that nobody else did. And that's how we got our Nick Drakes and our Mott the Hoopals and our Jethro Tulls and, and Jimmy Cliff. And there was all sorts of different artists. Don't forget Quintessence. And, do <laughs> and Dr. Strangely Strange. Yeah, right. <laughs> Kip of the Serene's a great I mean, they, they may never have sold a record, but these bands actually got a choice. You know, they actually yeah. did got a release and they went by volume rather than... But it does seem so wrong, because you're a great example of this, that if by album number three, Pyromania, it sells seven million copies, then you met, like, Hysteria, then sells 15 million copies. So two albums in a row sell about 25 million between them, which is, like, you know, unheard of. And it didn't happen with the first two. No. And, it pay, and for all the debt that we ran up on the first two albums... I think you repaid it by we, the next two. We paid it off, and they, you know, and, and they, they nurtured, or, and we, you know, between the record company allowing us to grow... And us having the, uh, the, the capability of doing that and knowing that we're in this for the long term, we never wanted it to be a five-year thing. I mean, I didn't think at the age of 21 I'd be doing this at the age of 42. No. But I did, by the time I was 29, start thinking, well, okay, yeah. I've lasted longer than T-Rex did. I've lasted longer than nearly every, the Beatles. And that's 13 years ago, you know. But I, now I, I want to follow what the, the Stones are doing. And they were always the yardstick. If the, Beat, if the Stones and Aerosmith are still doing this... Yeah. And they're actually selling loads of records and selling stadiums, and there's still a, a modicum of credibility and, and dignity involved in it all. There's no reason why you can't do it. And you don't, it's not like Logan's Run anymore, which is a phrase I always use. It's not 32 up the big ladder and you're out of here. It's like in the 70s, you were old at 32. <laughs> now, some of these bands aren't even 32 until they do their first, the thir you know, their first album, they're 32 years old when they actually start. But like, as the biggest selling rock group in the US from the UK ever on that level of that kind of music, etc. But like, when you were living those years, you must have known it was never necessarily going to last. Slang time, 1995, 96, was it a really low time? Or was it, listen, those days are definitely going to be gone. We are like professional musicians. This is what we do. We're going to keep making records. And let's leave those days behind with some fantastic, great, brilliant memory. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. By the time slang came around, we were mid-30s and you know you you reach a certain level I, I, I'm never going to use the word maturity but you reach a certain age where experience takes over and, and kicks in and, and you know you can see things slightly more clear and you don't panic and make stupid decisions we were the calmest band we've ever been up to that time we were more calm through that whole period because we were just like we just ride it out I mean, what people tend to forget, and that never gets mentioned, and, and rightfully so, because it, it's not really that important, but we put the album out. It didn't sell like previous records did. We knew that before it came out. So did our record company. Yeah. But they stuck with us anyway. But we still went to the States, and we still did 23,000 people in New York, and, and, and we went to South Africa for the first time. We did 50,000 people in Johannesburg. We did 20,000 people in... Bangkok. You know, we, we did an American tour where we were playing to 10, 15,000 people in arenas on, uh, for, for six months. Because the one thing that we had going for us that you never lose is a great back catalogue. If you go and see the Stones, all due respect to any new album, you have to indulge them for three or four songs, but you are going to pay homage to your childhood. Of course. And you want to hear Jumping Jack Flash, Let's Spend the Night Together, etc., etc. And it's the same with any band that's been around.